Greetings from the far side of the galaxy, I'm Fury, your host the most, here to bring you a story about titties. And I don't have any good titty jokes for this one, so uh, let's just move on. Remember that I do these videos by request, so leave whichever Osamu hero you want next in the comments below. Our next Osamu hero will be everyone's favorite dream demon out, but today we have someone else. Today's Osamu hero is the titanic terror tearing apart trash, Tetsuox. Spoiler warnings for chapters 6, 7, 8, 11, and the Jiangxi Night Event. To begin, let's discuss Tetsuwax's name because god damn it, life hunters can't make this easy. In Japanese, his name is Tetsugyu, literally meaning Iron Ox. In English, his name is Tetsuox, literally meaning Iron Ox. Don't ask me why life hunters only like half translated his name because I have like no idea. I think it's because whenever life hunters see something that's perfectly fine without being changed, they just hear the Kill Bill sirens. Although, getting back to the point, Tetsuwax is a very fitting name since he is, well, an ox. We don't know specifically what kind of bull he's based on, but we do know he goes to Umamichi Academy. A very fitting choice since Umamichi is styled after Asian but specifically Chinese aesthetics. I say it fits because Bull Boy is actually from Harai, the world based on Chinese literature, myths, and folklore. I mention literature because that's a useful tool we'll use later, but let's put that aside for now. We don't know his rule or role or even his sacred artifact to be honest. We know he has the power to kick up cyclones which he normally does by spinning his axe. However, in the Jiangxi night event, we see him do it by just spinning his arms, which is, I don't know, weird. Is his sacred artifact his arms, or spinning in general? You know what? I'm moving on to something we actually know. What we do know is that Umamichi is a school in Asakusa known for its thugs and delinquents, which fits Tetsuox quite well. He's loud and brash, more prone to thinking with his fist than his head, on top of habitually shirking his duties. Beyond that, Umamichi is a school that advocates for finding one's path in life, which ties back into Tetsuwaka's fraught past. It's no wonder that despite his school being in Asakusa, his home is in Kabukicho, because Tetsuwax is a member of the Kabukicho Outlaws. He doesn't have any specific role, just sort of filling in whenever one of the leaders needs a helping hand. Not that he's always helpful, because like I said, he's a bit of an airhead. He knows he's not the best at making decisions, so he leaves that to whoever he sees as his boss. Tetsuwax's greatest desire is to die by his master's side. Jesus H. Christ, that's depressing. And he's evidently decided that the protagonist is his boss, so he's one of those dudes like Lucifuge and Hakuman. When the protagonist says jump, they ask how high. It seems strange at first, but you have to take a look at who Tetsuwax is based on. That being Lee Kuei from the novel Water Margin, which is also known as Men of the Marsh and All Men Are Brothers. It's a very important book in the canon of Asian literature, being considered one of the four great classical Chinese novels. The story itself tells the tale of a group of men who through circumstance find themselves becoming outlaws. They make their home in the Yangshin Marsh, growing in notoriety to the point where the emperor enlists them in his army in exchange for a pardon. They battle against the incursion from the Liao dynasty, but many of the 108 heroes end up dying in the conflict. After the war, those that remain become civil servants or live out their lives as commoners. The ending is semi-tragic, where the protagonist is betrayed by those he wronged as an outlaw who should now be his allies. It's quite the book, and Lee Kuei is quite the character, but it's worth noting that he was not the protagonist. That title goes to Song Jiang, the man Lee Kuei would follow into death. That's not to say Lee Kuei was a minor character, no, the dude gets featured quite a lot. Starting with his physical description, Lee Kuei was a behemoth of a man. No, I don't mean literally, I mean metaphorically. Large and broad-shouldered, with dark skin and a hard look in his eyes. The only thing greater than his size being his strength, which earned him the nickname Iron Ox. But he was also known as Black Whirlwind for the way he cut through the battlefield, felling foe after foe with his axes at a rate that couldn't be matched. His story begins after he meets our main man, Song Jiang, after a bit of shenanigans. His biggest moment is after he becomes an outlaw and returns home to retrieve his mother. Skipping a whole thing about his brother and a guy and his wife, 
Lee Kuei begins to take his mother back to the marsh to live a comfortable life, literally carrying her on his back. However, when he puts her down to fetch some water, he returns to find his mother eaten by tigers? Jesus Christ, there's coming out of left field and then there's literally being eaten by tigers. Lee reacts to his mother being eaten by tigers about as well as you would expect and moidles off the tigers right back. And at first, the villagers present him as a hero for slaying the tigers only to turn on him once they learn he has a bounty. Lee Kuei does other things, actually being responsible for a lot of people joining the marshes because he can't stop killing people. His, let's just call it recruiting efforts, aren't too relevant, so let's just skip it. Like I said, the outlaws are eventually recruited by the Emperor to form the 108 Stars of Destiny to fight in his wars. Being one of the survivors, he becomes an official but despises the responsibility so he mostly shirks his duties. However, when Song calls him back and reveals that he's been tricked into drinking poisoned wine, Lee Kuei gladly shares a cup. The two of them die, but in the final chapter, in the Emperor's Dream, it's Lee Kuei who rushes him down, brandishing his axes to deal out justice. That just about wraps up all I have to say about Lee Kuei, so let's get into Life Hunter's interpretations. To begin, Tetsuwakta is pretty spot on to how Lee Kuei is described in the book. A huge man with dark skin, although Tetsuwax doesn't have Lee Kuei's unibrow. Though I have to admit, Tetsuwax does have some pretty thick eyebrows, so have a point on that. Rather than using the character's actual name, Lifehunders decided to have Tetsuwax go by the nickname given to him in the story, Iron Ox. And his second nickname of Black Whirlwind is referenced to his sacred artifact's activation phrase, Big Black Whirlwind. Although, I do find it mega odd that they changed Lee Kuei's weapon. In the book, he wielded two small axes, not a singular broad axe like the Transient does. Personality-wise, the Transient is pretty spot on, big, loud, and as stupid as he is loyal. Once the dudes found his boss, he'd follow them through thick or thin, rain or snow, heaven or hell, duel one, let's rock. I do have to say that Lee Kuei seems like the more evil of the two. In the book, it was so bad that his fellow bandits had to make a list of rules for him to follow so he would stop committing atrocities. That being said, what I find most interesting about Tetsuox is the way his backstory is delivered to us. Rather than being info dumped, we get most of what we know from a play. While I appreciate the change, it is a weird method of delivery, so I've done my best to piece it together. I can't guarantee I got every detail correct, but let's play the badass noise and get into Tetsuox's backstory. Death has always been terribly close to Tetsuox. Every time he struck out on his own, made a decision, someone died. Most things died at his own hand, like the tigers who ate his mother when he left to fetch some water. And then he was hailed as a hero for slaying the man-eating tigers and then hunted as a brigand for the bounty on his head. Life was always so quick to turn around, things never simple. Thankfully, he had his lord for that. He didn't have to think or make any decisions. His lord pointed in a direction and Tetsuox made sure everything in it died. But as I said, death follows Tetsuox and life is never so simple. His lord, his guiding star, died and Tetsuox was left with nothing and nowhere. The next part isn't super clear, but I figure that the agony of Lost mixed with having his path in life stolen sent him across that rainbow bridge. The specifics of what happened once he entered Tokyo aren't super clear either. We just know that he did find himself a place at Kabukicho. It's a good place for him that's honestly really similar to the marshes. But let's officially begin with the next section of the video with Tetsuwax's character analysis. Although real quick, since we're halfway through the video, please like and subscribe and check out some of my other stuff. I also have a Patreon and Kofi, which like, please check out. YouTube doesn't like the fact that I start every video by saying titties. Now, back to the show. Some of y'all are gonna get on my grill for this, but honestly, I have mixed feelings on Tetsuox. What we see in the main quest is honestly fairly basic. 
He falls into that big lovable lug character archetype, you know? He's just Kengo, but on the outlaw's side without too much actually being different about him. He's fairly basic in one note, it makes for an entertaining enough character in spurts, but it doesn't have enough meat to sink your teeth into. However, I do like him much more in Jiangxi Knight. Not only is having his backstory framed as a play interesting, it also adds so much to his character. Unlike in the entirety of the main quest, we get to see more than just Kengo Light. We get to see someone who has a reverence for the concept of death, seeing it as a peaceful end that should not be disturbed. And I know I said this like three times, but I can't stress this enough. I love the way his backstory is presented. It's much more interesting than just some info dump because we actually get to see characters react to it. Like Lee Cho when he learns that Tigers ate Tetsuwox's mother. The play is also a touching conclusion to his tale, giving him some closure to his mother's death. And it's a resolution that manages to involve a lot of characters in a great way. We've got Hanuman, the Jiangxi, Lee Cho, and Teramati who actually gets to do something for once. The story behind the play is really good too, I easily got involved with Tetsuox's backstory and his closure with his mother. Although it's kind of a waste that we don't get to see Tetsuox interact with Babylon and Ziz in the event. It would have been nice to see Mr. Mommy Issues interact with Asamo's two MILFs, but I digress. Because now is the time to hit up Tetsuox's units. He has three units, two normal and one limited from the Jiangxi Night event. Starting with his normal units, it's another attribute 3 star and spear type. His first skill is Lawbreaker. At phase start, he gets Vigor and removes Bind from himself at 90%. The two statuses are good, but I have to ask if they really couldn't give him 10% more proc. His next skill is Gambler, which applies crit plus plus at 16% when attacking. That garbage low proc makes the skill less than worthless, so let's move on. Thirdly is Retaker, which removes up to 60 CP from hit units at 100%. I rag on CP skills a lot, but removing up to 60 CP with every hit is pretty damn good. His final skill is Daredevil, and it has two parts. Part 1, when he leaves, he applies Remove All Debuffs and gives up to 2000 HP and a 2 square diamond radius at 100% to all allies. And Part 2, he resists Stigma at 100%. Hmm, much shorter than the other one. Honestly, Tetsuwax would make a decent sacrificial pawn, put him up front on a high difficulty quest so he can get a bit of healing and debuff removal. It's kind of a messed up strategy when you think about it too hard, but it's not a bad one. His next unit is a normal 4 star, which is nether attribute and sword type. You know, I expected one of these units to at least be long slash, you know, the weapon type associated with axes, but whatever. All of its skills are the same as a 3 star except for a single skill evolution. Gambler evolves into passionate gambler and gets quite a few new pieces. The crit plus plus remains, but he also gets up to 60 extra CP to himself, however it still has the same awful 16% proc. And before being hit, he has an 80% chance to get rage plus and tenacity to himself. I really like the combination of skills, rage plus increases attack and tenacity makes up for rage's defense debuff. I wish Lightfooters did this more often, playing with skills to offset their downsides and weaknesses. Finally, when appearing, he gets Rage plus Strengthening at 100%, finally tying the entire unit together. I have some thoughts on this one, but let's just mosey on over to his limited unit real quick. It's a Halloween unit, so of course, Tetsuwax is dressed up. He's dressed up as a Jiangxi, a kind of Chinese zombie whose arms are outstretched and hops along due to rigor mortis. It's a grass attribute and blow type 4 star and its first skill is whirlwind. After moving, he gets a weapon change to wand and loses 600 HP at 100%. I kinda like this skill, he's blow type, so this skill makes you choose between having some attack range in exchange for some HP. It's pretty neat. Next is Vagabond, which has two parts. At phase start, he gets crit to himself at 90%, and after being buffed, he gets up to 12 CP at 80%. Jeez, they're just stacking on these buffs like, I don't know, what's the thing people stack? Dominoes? Jenga blocks? Pringles? 
The third skill is Breakout Performer. After moving, he gets Archer and up to 20 CP to himself at 90%. There's even a 30% chance to apply Guts to himself after moving tacked on. You know, I'm beginning to see a pattern here with buffs being stacked onto this guy like tennis balls and one of those tube things. In slightly related news, I still don't know what kind of stuff people stack. His final skill is Killer Star Supernova. That sounds like something from Gurren Lagann. It does two things, gives him attack and defense up in a two square diamond radius when he leaves and makes him resist stigma at 100%. This unit is actually kind of a headache to build a team around, but we'll talk about that after I cover his normal units. His three star is a lot like Cthulhu's in that it's nothing more than a sacrificial pawn. You put them in front of your team expecting them to die and Tetsuox does that job pretty well. Healing and removing all debuffs is pretty good when things like possession and fear exist. His 4 star would be in that same sacrificial boat if it wasn't for that skill evolution. The rage strengthening really does help give him more utility since most of his skills hit 100% proc. His limited unit is one of the weirder ones I've seen. It applies no debuffs, instead just a ton of buffs making him very self-centered. Even his normal 4 star plays like this too and honestly I kind of dislike it because it's fairly boring. Team building just takes a back seat with them because they just don't interact with anyone. Their skills don't affect their enemies or allies so just throw them on whatever team you want cause it's not like they really work with anyone. Now let's wind this video down by talking about Tetsuwox's relationship chart. On one side, Nezha likes Tetsuwox because they're both Umamichi delinquents. And on the other side, Tetsuwox likes Waka and Tanka. That's because Wakan always manages to respect Tetsuwox despite the latter's difficulty making tough decisions. And on the flip side, Ziz dislikes Tetsuwox for his unrelenting desire to die for someone else. And Tetsuwox himself dislikes two people. Duo because his immense strength makes it hard for him to handle kids, and Licho due to him reminding Tetsuwox of the tigers who ate his mother. Since we're nearing the end, I'd like to look at Tetsuwox's loading screens, if he had any, so let's do a fun fact. While his limited unit's arms are outstretched to imitate a Jiangxi, in Tetsuwox's event character quest, he held out his arms so the player could help him undress. I'm just gonna throw a link to the Asamo English Archives video of it in the description. Think of it as a thanks for watching the video. Overall, Life Hunters needs to do more with Tetsuox. The main quest presents this simple character that never diverges from his archetype, but the event shows something else. He's got scars that run deep and self-esteem issues in abundance. I hope he gets another chance to have those addressed in another event, but that's a desperate hope. Though, to close out, I gotta give Tetsuox Fury's official seal of approval. His units are about as meh as his character in the main quest, but goddamn does he shine in the event. Before we go, let's get to our Patreon shoutouts. For our 3 stars, we have special thanks to 87 Werehog and Zoro Richao. This 4 star is empty. Yeet! And for our Super D Tuper special 5 star shoutouts, we have Unknown RC, who's blasting through with sonic speed. Then we have Vanilla Flower, who found you, faker. And then poor Mage, who knows it's no use. And finally, Mahogasaur, who can escape from the city. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and check out some of my other stuff. And as always, this is Rose Fury signing out.